All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right, very good. So today's lab for, for this week specifically, and the last part of the material that's going to be on our practical is what we call bone physiology, and then learning all of the bones of the appendicular skeleton. All right. So first, let's go through uh, some types of bones. Bones in the body, in the skeletal system, obviously, can be named or grouped depending on their structure. So for instance, you would have to know that, you know, the, the bones of the appendages, like the upper and lower arm brachial and antibrachial bones, here they show the humerus, that's your, your brachial bone, that's called a long bone. So any bone in our body that is longer than it is wide, basically, is called a long bone. Even the bones in your fingers and the palms of your hands are they're skinny, but they're longer than they are wide. Now, if you notice here, they have a little arrow coming from the wrist, the carpus right here. Those bones, there's eight little bones that make up your wrist or the carpus. And those bones are called short bones. Those bones are about equal in, you know, height and width. So they're just called short bones. We have bones in the body that are called flat bones. They show the sternum here. That's your breastbone. Everybody knows that word probably, your sternum. So flat bones, just like the name implies, well, they're flat. Flat bones are basically made up of two plates of compact bone with spongy bone in between. And I'll show you a picture of that as well. We also have some bones that aren't considered to be flat or long or short. They don't fit into one of the neatly into one of these categories. And so we call those irregular shaped bones. So those bones include bones like the bones that make up your vertebral column, the vertebrae. And we're gonna cover the vertebrae on the third practical as part of the axial skeleton. Um, some bones of the face considered to be irregular shaped bones. But then we have a strange bone. You guys know it as your kneecap. It's called the patella. This particular bone and a couple more in the body like it are called sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones are bones that are encased in connective tissue. So your patella is actually encased in the connective tissue, the uh, quadriceps uh, tendon that goes from the quad group muscles that we're gonna be learning later of your uh, femoral region. And that tendon inserts down on the tibial tuberosity, which we're gonna be learning today. So this bone is actually encased in connective tissue and we call it a sesamoid bone. That's what, that's what the patella is, all right? Now you also have to know some definitions. Um, for instance, on the practical, they might show you a long bone and they might have, you know, an area label. What is the name of the part of the long bone labeled one? I don't know, whatever. And so there are different parts of a long bone. So you have to know the science names for the parts of a long bone. So the ends of a long bone are called the epiphyses. If I say, if I put ES on the end of this, that means it's plural. There's, e, there's two epiphyses of a long bone because there's two ends. The end that is closer to the point of attachment to the trunk of the body is called the proximal epiphysis. So up here, as we're gonna be learning, this is the humerus again, your upper arm bone. This is the head of the humerus. And so this part of the humerus over here is what makes contact with your shoulder blade called the scapula and forms your shoulder joint. So this is the proximal end of the bone. So this is the proximal epiphysis, but at the opposite end is what we call the distal epiphysis. So the epiphyses are the very ends. The very middle of a long bone, which we call the shaft of the bone, the science name for that is called the diaphysis. Now, Obviously, there's only one diaphysis. You don't have more than one because you only have one shaft. 
but there's a section of the long bone that is in between the diaphysis and the epiphyses. So the bone tissue that is in between the shaft, the diaphysis, and the end, the epiphysis, is called the metaphysis. So you're gonna have to know these sections. So they might have a little number on a bone right here to ask you for that region. You'll have to say, well, technically this should be the distal metaphysis because this, this is the distal end of the bone. So this would be the distal metaphysis down here. And then up here is called the proximal metaphysis. Now we're also gonna be learning about our growth plate. Everybody's heard of the growth plate before, I'm sure. The growth plate, the science, the science name for that is called the, epiphyse, the, epith, uh, the epiphyseal plate in a child. As we grow up and we stop growing tall, that epiphyseal plate or the growth plate seals up and becomes bone. And in the adult, that is called the epiphyseal line. So if you took an x-ray of a child, this would be a little pad of cartilage in here. It's called the growth plate or epiphyseal plate. But if you, and you would be able to see that on an x-ray. If you took an x-ray of an adult, you wouldn't see that growth plate anymore because the cartilage has been converted into bone. And so we just call that the epiphyseal line. So you need to know the ends, the epiphyses, the metaphyses, diaphysis, whatnot. At the very ends of the epiphyses, there's a little pad of cartilage at the very end of articulating bones. That little pad of cartilage is called the articular cartilage, and it's a remnant of our fetal skeleton. And we have to get into that today as well. So that's the parts of a long bone. In your bone, in the skeletal system, there's actually two different types of bony tissue. Um, so we have to know a little bit about that. Dr. Russell. Go ahead. Is there articular cartilage at both ends of the bone or just the um, proximal epiphysis? No, at both ends. Okay. Like on, on this picture, see how it's blue? If, if, you, if you're looking in the pictures in your book, like the graphics, not the real bone, the real uh -huh. bones, you won't see the cartilage. It's gone. But on the pictures in your book where you see where it's colored blue, that is depicts where the, the articular cartilage is located. So the articular cartilage is basically hyaline cartilage we learned in, you know, for the last test. And it's a remnant of the fetal skeleton because all of our bones start off as hyaline cartilage and then it's converted to bone, at least your long bones. And so the very ends still have that pad of cartilage and it's to help uh, decrease friction at where bones meet together called a joint. And so when the bones move against each other, this allows for a more frictionless uh, environment for that movement to occur, right? It decreases friction. It smooths out the movement, in other words. Now, we have what's called compact and spongy bone. Now, both bone tissue, bony tissues are hard. So compact bone is hard tissue, spongy bone is hard tissue. So we don't call spongy bone spongy because it's soft. We call it spongy because if you look at it, like look at this picture. This is, this is a, a section of a real humerus, by the way, the brachial bone. You cut it open and this is what it looks like on the inside. So look at all this tissue in here. It looks kind of like a sponge. So that's why we call it spongy because there's many more little bitty holes in here. So even though our bone tissue is hard, it doesn't mean it's completely solid. There are little holes in our bony tissue. It's just that the little bitty holes in spongy bone are larger and more numerous than in compact bone. So just to let you know, compact bone, which you see the little pointers here, compact bone forms the diaphysis of all long bones. It forms the outer plates of all flat bones. And it is the bone tissue that covers the outside of every bone in your body. So if you were handling a real bone and you're touching it, you would first be touching compact bone. Now, so where, where does that leave spongy bone? Well, spongy bone is found on the insides of, of bones and 
in certain places. As far as long bones are concerned, spongy bone is found in the epiphyses and towards the metaphyses of all the long bones, so at the ends of the bone. So notice this is up towards the, what's called the head of the humerus. You, you can see that little epiphyseal line right there. You can barely see it. So this is where the growth plate was in this person when they were a child still growing tall. So all of our spongy bone is located in the epiphyses of long bones. It's found in between the plates of flat bones, like the cranial bones, your sternum, things like that. And it's found in the middle of irregular shaped bones. So if I go back to this picture, so in the very middle of this bone, the vertebra, if I could cut this open, I would see spongy bone in there. In between the plates of this flat bone, there's spongy bone. Inside this short bone, there's spongy bone. Inside the plates of this patella, spongy bone. Inside the ends of the long bones, spongy bone, the epiphyses. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that as well is because all of these spaces in spongy bone is filled with a very important tissue in our body, and it's called red bone marrow. So the red bone marrow is found wherever we have spongy bone. And the reason why that's important is because the red bone marrow is where all of your blood cells are produced throughout your entire life. I'm, I'm probably sure you heard of people with certain types of cancers that have to have a marrow transplant. You ever heard of that? Well, they're talking about red bone marrow. And so they have to really, people that have certain types of blood cancers or uh, whatnot, they have to kill off their, their marrow and then have a donor marrow injected into the bone. So we'll talk more about that when we get the AMP2, but nonetheless, wherever we have spongy bone is where we find red bone marrow. Um, also, long bones have a hollow center in the diaphysis. I forgot to mention that. So in the very middle of a long bone, none of the other bones, just in the middle of long bones, there is a cavity. It's called the medullary cavity. And in this medullary cavity is another type of marrow. It's called yellow bone marrow. And yellow bone marrow basically is adipose tissue. So they're basically fat in the middle of our long bones. It's called yellow bone marrow. All right, now I'm going to move away from this for a second. Uh, we're going to get back to it, uh, at least for the structure of compact bone. But let's go through the cells that are found in our bony tissue and what they are and a little bit about what they do. <clears throat> so we have four basic cell types that we're learning. Really, two of them are the most important physiologically. I'm going to show you what they are. But nonetheless, um, the first cell you see here, it says osteogenic cell. The osteogenic cell basically is a stem cell that has the ability to develop into an immature bone cell. The immature bone cell is called an osteoblast. So whenever we need to make new bone. We have osteogenic cells that then develop and differentiate into osteoblasts. The reason why that is important is because the osteoblasts are the cells that make new bony tissue. So you can remember this by just, you know, repeating after me, osteoblasts are bone building cells. They build bone. So while we're growing up, we, our bones are, are growing in mass. They're getting bigger, so we have to produce new bony matrix. Or when you break a bone, you know it heals. So osteoblasts are the cells that make our bone tissue. It forms all the bony matrix of our bone tissue. Now, once the osteoblasts produce bony matrix, they basically trap themselves in a hole. And I mentioned this name for the last practical, if you remember lacunae. Remember a lacuna was a hole? Well, the osteoblasts are building the bony matrix in 360 degrees around them. They just deposit the calcium salts and they produce the protein fibers and then they trap themselves in a hole. 
Once that happens and they have no more space around them where they can secrete bony matrix, they then develop into the mature bone cell called an osteocyte. The osteocytes are the mature cells that maintain our bony matrix. Your bones are living structures, they're living tissue. They're not just sitting in there doing nothing, they change all the time. I mean, let's face it, you know when your bone is doing something if you break a bone, right? Because you know the bone's gonna heal itself. So it's not a static tissue, it's very dynamic, it changes all the time. We, go, we even go through something called bone remodeling, even after your bones are formed. Older bony matrix is, is uh, gotten rid of and we produce new bony matrix. So ultimately these are the bone cells from start to finish from the, the stem cell, immature bone cell called the osteoblast, which makes the bony matrix, and then the mature bone cell called the osteocyte, which lives in the lacunae. We then have this strange cell over here called the osteoclast. The osteoclast is one of two types of cells in our body that have multiple nuclei in them. The rest of our cells have one nucleus. You know, the majority of the cells in the body have that one nucleus. These osteoclasts actually have multiple nuclei in them. But nonetheless, the osteoclasts are cells that break down bony matrix. Yep, you heard it right. We have cells that, that degrade our own bone. And the cells that degrade our own bone are called osteoclasts. So the osteoclasts, when they break down bony matrix, and I'm gonna tell you why that's important when we go through calcium homeostasis, but when osteoclasts break down the bony matrix, that is called bone resorption. And notice this word does not say reabsorption. It says resorption. So that's different than reabsorbing something. So the osteoclast basically break down bony matrix and releases all of the components into the blood once we break down the bony matrix. Osteoblasts are cells that build up bony matrix. They make new bone. So these two cells are exactly opposite to each other. Osteoblast and osteoclast. Osteoblasts make bone. Osteoclasts break bone down, the bony matrix. So we say these two cells are antagonistic to one another. Antagonistic means they do opposite things, right? And we're gonna learn uh, some hormones that ultimately, and, and vitamins that ultimately increase or decrease the activity of these two cells. Because we have to balance the activity of osteoblast and osteoclast. In other words, we don't want the osteoclast doing their job more often than they should. Because if, if the osteoclasts are doing their job more often than they should, you're basically breaking down too much bone. And guess what that leads to? Brittle bone, osteoporosis. There are some hormonal abnormalities that ultimately cause people's osteoclasts to work more than they should and they keep breaking down the person's bony matrix and they end up with osteoporosis right now osteoblasts on the other hand are the cells that make new bone so this the the activity of these two cells have to be balanced in our body and it is what i'm trying to tell you all right so let's look at the types of things that are found in bony matrix first of all there's a lot of collagen in our in our bone a lot of fi uh, collagen fibers. It's technically type one collagen. Um, there's three main types of collagen fibers. So this particular collagen fiber is one of the strong ones. They're, they're all strong, but this is one of the strongest. Um, and so the osteoblasts have the job of laying down all of these, these substances to make up the extracellular matrix of bone. So the extracellular matrix of bone is made up of protein fibers, and minerals. So the minerals, the predominant mineral is called hydroxyapatite. I know it's a weird word, but basically it's a calcium salt. You do not have to memorize the formula of hydroxyapatite. I'm not gonna put that on the test. But what you should know about hydroxyapatite is that it is a calcium, you see CA right here is calcium, phosphate salt. 
This is a salt. This is phosphate. So the majority of all the minerals that make up the extracellular matrix in our bone is basically calcium and phosphate. Now we have lesser amounts or what we call trace amounts of other minerals. There's magnesium, sodium, potassium, and carbonate. That's what CO3 is down here, carbonate. These are other trace amounts of substances found in our bony matrix. So ultimately, everybody already knows this. You know that probably the majority of the calcium in your body is locked up in your bone. You know you need calcium for strong bones. We already know that because calcium is what makes our bones strong, right? Makes it nice, hard, and strong. So this salt, calcium phosphate salt, it is the majority of all the minerals that are in our bone. Now, your bone contains about 98% of all of the calcium that's found in your body to 98.5%. So ultimately, if our blood calcium levels start to fall and it, they get too low, we have to go to the storeroom to get some calcium out. So guess what the storeroom is? You guessed it. It's your bone. So if and ever when your blood calcium concentration, your blood calcium levels start to get too low, which is called hypocalcemia, by the way. If someone starts to become hypocalcemic, there's a hormonal reflex that technically activates osteoclast activity. The osteoclast release enzymes onto the surface of bone basically spongy bone, and those enzymes degrade away the salt. And it releases the salts from the bony matrix. And again, the majority of the salt is calcium phosphate salt called hydroxyapatite. So there's a hormone that can cause osteoclast to basically release the calcium from our bone and put it in the blood when we need it, All right? So these are the substance is found in bony matrix. Now I'll just say this, you already know your bone is hard. It's a hard tissue. So what makes the bony matrix hard? Well, all of our minerals, basically the majority of it is calcium, but you might not realize it, but your bones are also somewhat flexible. Now, albeit there's a lot more flexible when we're a kid, when we're younger, but they do have some flexibility to them. And that flexibility is attributed to the collagen that's found running through the bony matrix. So we have some flexibility and we have strength, a hardened strength dealing with our calcium salts. So let's look at what our bony matrix and the structure of our bony matrix is inside of a bone. So what we're looking at here on this picture Obviously, it's a graphic. It comes from your textbook. It's in chapter six. Um, a little bitty section from a long bone has been removed. You see up here, whatever long bone this might be, and they pull it out and enlarge it so we can see up close all of the structures here. So we also have a bone model, a bone tissue model that resembles this, and we're going to go over that as well. So what you're looking at from the outside of the bone, here would be the outside. All of our bones are surrounded by a connective tissue uh, capsule around it. This is called the periosteum. The periosteum is composed of two primary layers. The outermost layer is called the fibrous layer. Basically, it's dense collagen fibers around your bone. Now, just on the inside of that dense connective tissue, we then have what's called a cellular layer or the osteogenic layer. You kind of, if you look really close at the picture, you kind of can see little cells in there. So that's a cellular layer called the osteogenic layer. These cells are, let's face it, the osteogenic cells that have the ability to develop into osteoblast and actually do when you break a bone, that's a, a trigger for them to differentiate and to produce osteoblasts, and they start building new bony matrix to repair your bone. 
So that's called the periosteum around the bone. Now from the edge right here all the way to the middle, this would be the medullary cavity over here. You look up here at the top. So this would be the medullary cavity in the middle of a long bone. So from the cavity to the end is where we find the compact bone. So compact bone found in the diaphysis of, of long bones, covering the outside of all bones, and forming the plates of flat bones are all made up of a circular structures called an osteon. So this complete circular structure you see here is called an osteon. Osteons have several things that we need to be able to identify. So let's look at it right here, just a little bit larger. The osteon contain these little rings. Notice they have these ring structures. So we learned some of these terms already, so we're just gonna go over it again. The ring structures are called lamellae, plural or lamella singular. On each one of the lamellae is a little hole called a lacuna where the osteocytes live. So let's look at the one that's enlarged over here. Here they show where a lacuna would be. That would be the darker brown. And then the cell that is inside the hole, that's called the osteocyte. This is the cell that is the mature cell of living bone. They live inside that little hole, which is called the lacuna. Now notice that the membrane, the plasma membrane of these mature osteocytes have these extensions. Those extensions go into a little canal that perforate through the compact bone. Those little canals are seen as these little hair looking structures in between the lamellae. And so those little canals are called canaliculi. That just means small canal right there. So if you notice all the little hair like structures interconnect all of the lamellae together but they also interconnect all of the lacunae where the osteocytes are living. And they ultimately connect to the very middle of the osteon. Notice in the very middle of the osteon, there's a, a little tunnel where blood vessels are running. A little artery, a little vein. That's called the central canal that runs up and down through the bone. So each osteon has a central canal where there are blood vessels, an artery, and a vein that run through there. Those blood vessels also are interconnected to all the other blood vessels everywhere. Your bone is very vascular. That's why you bleed a good bit if you break a bone, typically, um, are interconnected with what are called the perforating, uh, the perforating vessels or the Volkmann vessels. These run through what's called a perforating canal. So the canals that run sideways through the bone are called perforating. And the canal that runs up and down through the osteon are called central canals. Now, at least in this particular section of bone through a long bone, over by the medullary cavity, they also show in the picture a little bit of spongy bone. So notice the spongy bone looks a lot different than the compact bone. There's no big true circular structures called osteons. So spongy bone does not have an osteon, a true osteon. They still have canaliculi and they have some lamellae. They have the osteocytes living in lacunae, even though they're not showing it here. Oh, it's on the next picture. But there, there is no central canal, all right? So, Let's look at the, the picture. We identified this picture on the uh, first practical with the tissue. You would recognize this as compact bone. You see the little circular structures. Those are osteons everywhere. The very middle of the osteon is the central canal. The little bitty dark elongated structures are the osteocytes living in lacunae in there. Now, if we look at spongy bone, up close, spongy bone is made of these plates, these irregular plates of bony tissue, which are called trabeculae. If we cut the trabecula open, trabecula, singular, trabeculae, plural, you then can see, you know, stuff that looks familiar. We still see rings. Those are lamellae. 
You still see the hair-like structures. Those are the canaliculi. And you still see a hole in the bony matrix where the cell's living. That hole is called the lacuna. The cell in there is called the osteocyte, right? Now, notice we have osteoblasts, and then they show an osteoclast. Osteoclasts are going to degrade the bony matrix when we need it to and release the calcium into the blood. Osteoblasts do exactly the opposite. They actually build up new bony matrix in our bone. So these two cells are antagonistic. One it builds bone, one tears the bone down. Oh, and you have to excuse me today, I'm having an allergy attack. So if I sound funny, I'm sorry <laughs> about that. All right, so we have to know a little bit, not as much detail as you have to know for lecture, but we have to know at least the, the, the steps involved in how bones form in the embryo and the fetus and the baby growing in utero. So while we're growing in utero, our skeletal system will begin to form. Your skeletal system begins to form at about week six of gestation. And the skeletal system is not made of bone at that point. It's actually made of hyaline cartilage at least a majority of them, all the long bones. But we have two different ways that the bones will form in the baby when, is, when he or she is growing in utero. We have something called intramembranous ossification, and we have something called endochondral ossification. So let's go through what each one of these types are, and I'm gonna show you the steps involved in them. So just to let you know, Mem intramembranous means within a membrane. Intra means within, membranous ob obviously membrane. So intramembranous ossification is a type of bone formation that forms the flat bones in the body. The flat bones. And here they show the baby skull and the, the little bones that form parts of the, what's called the cranium. We're going to learn uh, for the third practical. And so those bones are, called, are flat bones. There's actually two plates of compact bone, but there's no medullary cavity. Sandwiched in between these two plates is spongy bone. So how do we make this anyway? Well, uh, intramembranous ossification starts with what we call an ossification center. That's just a fancy term for bone formation center. Ossification means bone formation. So the osteoblasts are actually going to develop from an embryonic cell uh, that develops from what we call mesenchyme. Mesenchyme is an embryonic tissue. And so the osteoblasts start to accumulate in the area where the bone is supposed to form. And it begins, the osteoblasts begin to lay down the bony matrix. Now that bony matrix forms a, basically, it's not a true bony matrix yet. It's, it's more pliable. It's a lot of collagen fibers in there. However, which forms a connective tissue membrane. That's where intramembranous comes from. It forms a connective tissue membrane predominantly of collagen fibers first. However, the next stage of bone formation for flat bones is where the calcium salts and the other trace minerals get deposited around the collagen fibers in that connective tissue membrane. That's called calcification. So calcification is the hardening of bone tissue. Ossification is the formation of bone. So obviously, Ossification is going to involve ultimately calcification as well. So the osteoblasts then start laying down the calcium salts everywhere. And then that is what makes the bone hard. Actually deposited in all of that extracellular matrix and the bone becomes hard. We then have the mesenchyme at the edges of where the bone is developing start to condense down 
And ultimately, that will form the periosteum of the bone. So what are we left with? Well, ultimately in the middle, we have the little trabeculae of spongy bone that's being developed. You see it better in the last stage of the development, which is where the periosteum will develop. And in the very middle, you see all of the little holes and the, where the trabeculae are of spongy bone. So that periosteum now is a connective tissue membrane that surrounds the outside of the bone. It came from a condensation or a condensing down of the mesenchymal cells along the edges of where the bone is developing. So we have the development of a, a connective tissue membrane that begins ossification. So we call that the ossification center. Organic fibers, collagen fibers are laid down. The osteoblasts then start laying down the mineral salts and other trace minerals around the collagen fibers, which makes the bone hard and we call that calcification. We then have the development of the trabeculae of spongy bone that's where all of the little holes are going to be starting to develop, typically from osteoclast in there. And the, tra uh, tr the trabeculae are infiltrated with a whole bunch of blood vessels that brings all of the nutrients into where the bone is developing. Then we have the remodeling where the compact bone is on the edges, the spongy bone is in the middle, and the periosteum is the last to develop in intramembranous ossification. So we have the ossification center, we have calcification, you have the formation of spongy bone and trabecula, and then you have the formation of the periosteum. So this is how flat bones are made in the body. Now the long bones in the body, and here you see the little fetal skeleton, about week 12 of the, of the uh, fetal growth. Long bones in the body are formed from a cartilaginous model. A model of what the bone looks like that is formed of hyaline cartilage. And so ultimately that hyaline cartilage has to be converted into bone. So the conversion of cartilage to bone is called endochondral ossification. This is basically the replacement of cartilage with bone. So what we have here are mesenchymal cells will infiltrate the part of the body where the bone needs to develop, whether it's the upper arm bone, the humerus, the two lower arm bones, the ulna and the radius, your a femur, which is in your thigh, whatever. Wherever the long bones are supposed to develop, we have an accumulation of mesenchymal cells that will then develop into chondroblasts, not osteoblasts. So these chondroblasts basically lay down cartilaginous matrix and basically produces a cartilage model of what the bone will look like. So the first stage of endochondral ossification is what is called the development of a cartilage model, stage one. We then have the growth of the cartilage model. But during the stages where the cartilage model was produced and then growing, getting bigger, the chondroblasts in the very middle turn into chondrocytes, those which are mature cartilaginous cells. Those mature chondrocytes then do something that's kind of crazy. They continuously grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger around like an overfilled water balloon. So if you're filling up balloons with water and you keep filling it up, what's going to happen to the balloon? Exactly. It's going to pop open. It's going to burst open. So our chondrocytes in the very middle of the cartilaginous model actually grow so big that they pop open and die. And what happens there is calcium is deposited in all of the little holes that is left over where the cells used to be. So we actually form an area of calcified cartilage. The cartilage becomes hard. Along the edges of the cartilage model, 
osteoblasts had developed and they began to produce the compact bone of the diaphysis of the long bone. Those are called the bony collars, by the way. So we have the bony collar formation and we have calcified cartilage where the chondrocytes burst open and they basically died. And you might think that's kind of strange and it is, but it's a pretty important step in order to get that cartilage converted over into bone tissue. Because look what happens during stage three. In stage three, we develop what's called the primary ossification center. That develops because of an infiltration of an artery. As you see here, it's called a nutrient artery. When the nutrient artery perforates what becomes a diaphysis of the bone, we ultimately have osteoblasts that build up bony matrix in here, but ultimately osteoclasts come behind them and, and, and degrade away the bony matrix in the middle. So since this is the place where we, we develop bone first, it's called the primary ossification center. So osteoclasts have the job of coming in here and degrading away all of the bony matrix, but just in the middle. And that's where the medullary cavity comes from in a long bone. So the osteoblast laid down the bony matrix along the edges of the diaphysis, which is all compact bone, and the osteoclast degraded away the bony matrix to form the medullary cavity. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, now we have converted what used to be cartilage into areas of bony matrix because of osteoblast and osteoclast activity. In the very middle of what is the diaphysis of the bone is where we start building the bony matrix first, and that's why it's called the primary ossification center. This, excuse me, the secondary ossification center happens at the ends of the bone, basically in the epiphyses, the proximal epiphysis and the distal epiphysis, which is not shown. And that happens again because of the infiltration of blood vessels. So the blood vessels that infiltrate the ends of our bones are lo and behold called epiphyseal vessels. The epiphyseal artery, there's an epiphyseal vein. So the, the, the name of the vessel is really the name of where it's at in the bone. So you're not gonna identify these blood vessels, but I'm just letting you know that in both cases, the primary ossification center and the secondary ossification center required a blood vessel infiltrating that area of the model. And why is that important? Because everything that the cells need to build bony matrix with is in the blood. So without a blood supply, we can't deliver the building blocks to make the bone. So the blood vessels infiltrate the ends. We have a very similar event in the secondary ossification center as we see in the primary ossification center, except there's one main difference. Here, osteo, the, the cells, the, the, I'm sorry, the chondrocytes that are in the cartilage grow really, really big and they die and they pop open, just like we saw over here. And that's called hypertrophy, by the way, when the cells get really big, it's called hypertrophy. So the chondrocytes hypertroph and they burst open and they die. And then calcium is laid down and it, it forms a hard cartilage, calcified cartilage. That calcified cartilage is degraded away by osteoclast, but instead of leaving a hole behind, osteoblasts come in and start to produce spongy bone. And that's why we see spongy bone at the ends of long bones. The osteoclasts do not degrade away all of that bony matrix that the osteoblasts are laying down. The osteoblasts lay down that spongy bone, and now you have just converted a model of the bone that was made of cartilage into bone, endochondral ossification. Now, there's still a lot of cartilage in the bone. Notice right here in the metaphyseal region, just in between the metaphysis and the epiphysis. So remember the epiphysis, the end, 
from here down to here is called the metaphysis. That's called the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is our growth plate. It makes our bones grow long. So while we are children, and even the baby growing in utero, the bones are going to get bigger as the baby grows. But even after we're born, our, our, obviously, you know, a baby gets taller and we grow and grow and grow until we stop growing. So we get tall and our bones get bigger because of a couple of ways, uh, apositional growth and interstitial growth. But, and I'll show you those terms in a second, but that comes from the epiphyseal plate, that growth from within that makes our bones grow tall or long. So this plate is a remnant of the hyaline cartilage that our bones all start with. So all of our bone, long bones in our body started as a hyaline cartilaginous model. The very ends of all the long bones in the body are a remnant. The articular cartilage is a remnant, even in an adult, in you, is a remnant of your fetal skeleton because the very ends of the bone or the cartilage model stays as hyaline cartilage, and that's called the articular cartilage. All right, so let's look at the de definitions here. The way our bones grow is through what we call interstitial growth and apositional growth. Interstitial means within the tissue, so that's coming from within the bone, and this occurs at the epiphyseal plate. This makes our bones grow longer in length. Apositional growth is the growth around the outside surface of the bone. It occurs at the periosteum. So that makes your bones get thicker around, right? Increases the thickness. So interstitial growth, we get longer bones. Apositional growth from the outside, the bones get thicker. Now you're gonna have to know the zones of the growth plate, the epiphyseal plate. Uh -huh. The zones of the growth plate, which basically is a pad of hyaline cartilage, there's four principal zones. You have these epiphyseal plates in the metaphysis at either the proximal end and the distal end. They don't show the distal end. So you have one at the top, you have one at the bottom. A couple of bones, like the proximal end of the femur, there's actually two different little plates, but, but that's neither here nor there for this talk. So the areas of the epiphyseal plate are all called the zone of something. So the part of the, the plate that anchors the plate to the epiphysis of the bone, notice it's the epiphysis, the part of the plate that anchors the whole plate to the epiphysis is called the zone of resting cartilage. So that's what this first part is called the zone of resting cartilage. Now, just deep to that, or in this case from the proximal epiphyseal plate, just distal to that, is called the zone of proliferating cartilage. It is this zone of proliferating cartilage where the chondroblasts are dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing over and over and over. That's what proliferation is. Basically, the cells undergo mitosis. So when these cells are dividing faster, you grow tall quicker than when they're dividing via mitosis more slowly. So everybody knows you went through a growth spurt. And if you have children, you saw them one summer kind of shoot up a little bit. You know, that's because of hormones. And there are some hormones that act on the epiphyseal plate and make the zone of proliferating cartilage divide faster and faster and faster. So when these cells are dividing, they get pushed downward, at least in the proximal plate. They get pushed downward, down the plate. So the cells at the top in the proliferating zone divide and they get pushed downward. As they enter the next zone, the cells, the chondrocytes at this point, are growing and growing and growing until they get really big. Since they're growing really, really big, it's called the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. Uh -huh. 
So the zone of hypertrophic cartilage, as the name implies, hypertrophy, means the cells get really big. As they are moving or migrating down the plate, as they get to the edge of that zone, they all burst open. They pop open like an overfilled water balloon. And when chondrocytes pop open and die, it makes the cartilage become calcified, just like we saw in endochondral ossification. The cartilaginous matrix has to be calcified before we can turn cartilage into bone. The same thing happens at the epiphyseal plate. So we have what's called the zone of calcified cartilage. Now, in order to turn this little bitty zone into bone, osteoclasts come in here and they degrade away the bony matrix. I mean, I'm sorry, degrade away the calcified matrix of the cartilage. Osteoblasts then come behind them and turn all of that into bony matrix. And so we grow taller just by this much. Our diaphysis grows taller just by that much because the zone of calcified cartilage is what becomes the new area of bone tissue. <coughs> Excuse me. So let me show you the, a picture of a real plate. So there, you'll see a picture like this on the test. You won't see one like this. So let me show you what the plate looks like off of a, a real histology slide of one. And we can see what the bone, uh, what the, the plate looks like and what the areas are. And I need to tell you where this particular epiphyseal plate is coming from. This particular plate is flipped upside down from the picture that we just looked at. So notice this real quick. And here's how you'll always know. The zone of resting cartilage is always the zone that is anchoring to the epiphysis. The zone of calcified cartilage is always the zone that is closest to the diaphysis. So look at this plate. This plate shows the zone of resting cartilage at the bottom now, but the zone of calcified cartilage at the top. That means this epiphyseal plate is the plate that comes from the distal end of the bone. <coughs> so the plate at the other end of the bone, which I don't have a picture directly to show you, this plate is flipped upside down. So if, if you could envision, if you can envision that this plate was at the top, the zone of resting cartilage would be flipped all the way to the top. You would have to twist this all the way around. So they're, they're just inverted. So here we have the zone of resting cartilage. The zone, the next zone to that is always the zone of proliferating cartilage. So here's an easy way to identify it. In the zone of proliferating cartilage, you'll always see little bitty areas that look like stacks of coins little bitty stacks. These are the chondroblasts that are dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing. So as the cells divide, 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 they get pushed down, in this case, up the plate. So they're getting pushed and pushed and pushed up the plate towards the next zone. The next zone is called the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. Here's where they pop open and die, right here. That little zone right there, you, and, and you can notice from here, by the way, see how small this is? But all of a sudden, the little areas are getting bigger around. So at this area up here, the cells are getting really big, they die and they pop open. That's called hypertrophic cartilage. So this zone is what then becomes calcified in what we call the zone of calcified cartilage. This is the area where osteoclast will degrade away. This is all dead cartilage right here. It's calcified. Osteoclast degrade this away. And osteoblasts come in and lay down bony matrix right here. So 
our diaphysis or the diaphyseal end of the plate got bigger only or longer only by this much each time. So this becomes a new bone tissue. So in other words, this area where we see the bone of the diaphysis, this used to be calcified cartilage. The calcified cartilage area used to be the zone of hypertrophic cartilage and so forth and so on. So as these cells are getting pushed downward, we always change going down. So this plate makes the bone grow longer from here down. It appears that the plate moves down, but the one at the very top appears to move upward. So the diaphysis grows in between them. So I hope that makes sense a little bit. All right, now we have to go through some, some uh, other physiology dealing with bones before we get into the actual bones themselves. Uh, so all, let me tell you what some of these factors are that affect bones. We're gonna go over the minerals. Obviously, calcium and phosphate are the two that make the bone the strongest, but all of these are found in bone. So we need calcium, you need phosphate, you need magnesium, we have some fluoride in our bone. I know you heard of that before because your, your toothpaste. There's some fluoride in there. Uh, there's also a little bit of sodium in there. And then a, a, another trace mineral called manganese. So all of these minerals are in our bone. The two most concentrated ones are calcium and phosphate. But all of these minerals is what makes our bone hard. <laughs> makes our bone hard. We also need vitamins to make our bones grow. The, these vitamins, vitamin A and D and K, these are fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin C is a water soluble vitamin. You're gonna learn that in your nutrition class. But let me tell you a little bit about what these vitamins do. Vitamin A is required to maintain the normal activity of osteoblasts. So if someone has a vitamin A deficiency, they have other problems in the body. I can't go through all the vitamin abnormalities, but one of the vitamin A deficiencies means that the bones are, they have, they're painful. A person has, uh, they can't heal their bone very well. They don't have good bone growth. But the first thing you would see with a vitamin A deficiency, it affects your eyes. Basically causes night blindness. But nonetheless, it affects your bone as well. So vitamin A is required to have your osteoblast be able to build bone. Vitamin C is required for collagen fibers to be produced. So without vitamin C, you actually develop a, a nutritional deficit of vitamin C, a disease called scurvy. You may have heard of that before. Um, and that basically means the bones aren't strong and it's very painful. The joints are painful. Um, so vitamin C is required for the osteoblast to make collagen fibers. Vitamin D is required to maintain calcium in the body. It, it helps increase blood calcium levels. So vitamin, that's just one of its roles. So vitamin D increases our blood calcium levels, as I'll mention again in a minute. And we need the calcium in the blood to go to where the osteoblasts are to make bone for calcification. Vitamins K and B12, and B vitamins are water soluble. K is a fat soluble vitamin, but K and B12 are vitamins that are required for the cells in our bodies to make protein. So obviously the osteoblasts have to build a lot of protein. So even in our bone tissue, we need these vitamins to make protein for our bony matrix. What about some hormones? What are the hormones? And a little bit about how they affect our, bone, our skeletal system. Well, we have something called human growth hormone. I should have wrote that out. HGH is called human growth hormone. Human growth hormone, as the name implies, makes the tissues in the body grow. It does a lot more than that. We're going to learn everything about it in AMP2. But <clears throat> it doesn't work alone. It also causes the liver and some other tissues to make 
small secreted protein hormones called uh, IGFs. These are insulin-like growth factors. That's what that stands for, IGFs, insulin-like, insulin-like growth factors. So together, human growth hormone and IGFs stimulate the cells in the zone of proliferating cartilage to divide faster and faster and faster and faster than they normally would. So in part, these hormones are involved, along with these, involved in our growth spurts. Just like estrogen and testosterone, thyroid hormones, insulin even. You guys know insulin already because it deals with your blood sugar, but insulin also causes protein production in our body. Estrogen helps make your bone grow because estrogen decreases osteoclast activity, which allows your osteoblast to build your bony matrix. However, what is kind of strange is that the reason why we stop growing tall is because of estrogen. Yep. Estrogen makes your bones grow, but at a little higher concentration, they make your bones stop growing. There's a fine line there. So estrogen at a moderate concentration decreases osteoclast activity and allows osteoblasts to build the bone faster. But at a high concentration, the estrogen causes your epiphyseal plates to seal up because it decreases osteoclast activity so much that osteoblast come in and turn all of the cartilage of the epiphyseal plate into bone, which then forms the epiphyseal line in the adult bone. That, that's caused from estrogen. Now, testosterone is obviously a male hormone, but females have a version of this. It's produced by the adrenal gland, and it's an anabolic hormone. So testosterone is one reason why males have larger, denser bones and larger, denser muscle mass um, because testosterone is highly anabolic. It makes the cells produce a lot of protein. So testosterone is, and estrogen for that matter, are hormones that become more concentrated at puberty, as you know. So at puberty, these are the hormones that bring about a lot of the changes, the pubescal changes uh, that we all go through. You have a growth spurt, you know, you have a deepening of the voice in males, distribution of hair patterns, all the stuff that changes between males and females are, are due to these hormones. And the main male pattern changes are due to testosterone. Now, thyroid hormones are, uh, have a, several roles in the body. One of them, it causes your, your cells to produce a lot of protein, just like insulin. So in order for any tissue to grow, you have to build a lot of protein. So thyroid hormones and insulin, all of these hormones are making your epiphyseal plate produce more bony matrix faster. So all together, all of these hormones are making the, the epiphyseal plate work harder than normal. All right, so we just have a few more things to go through and I'm gonna let you take a little break um, before we start identifying the bones. So I'm gonna let you guys look at this. This is pretty generic. We're gonna get into calcium homeostasis and the hormones that are required to maintain it. So this generic picture shows the homeostasis of the level of calcium in the blood. So calcium levels in the blood are the controlled, is the controlled condition. What happens if we get too much calcium in the blood? That is, if it gets high. If there's too much calcium in the blood, that's called hypercalcemia. So what happens, right? What happens if the calcium gets too low in the blood? Which is called hypocalcemia. So let's just start. Calcium starts to rise. There are special cells in the thyroid gland that say, hey, we have too much calcium. So those cells then release a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin causes our calcium levels in the blood to go back down to normal. Basically, 
It, cause, it, it allows the osteoblast to take the calcium from the blood and deposit it into the bone. So if the osteoblasts are removing calcium from the blood and putting it into bone, your blood calcium levels are going to come back down to normal. But what happens if the blood calcium levels fall too low and you have hypocalcemia? Well, there are cells in the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland lies on the back of the thyroid. So these four little nodules of glandular tissue are called the parathyroids. And the thyroid gland, by the way, is located in your cervical region, just below your Adam's apple and on either side of it. So this is the back or the posterior part of the thyroid. And there's four little nodules of glandular tissue called the parathyroids. So when your calcium levels are low, the parathyroid gland releases parathyroid hormone, PTH. Now, parathyroid hormone has several effects in our body, and all of them tries to increase your blood calcium levels back to normal. So parathyroid hormone is actually going to turn on the osteoclasts. And when parathyroid hormone is present, we have an increase in osteoclast activity, which degrades your bony matrix and releases calcium back to the blood. So we have this cycle where if we get too high, we release calcitonin. If we get too low, we release parathyroid hormone. And we maintain a balance, homeostasis, of calcium. So here's the flow chart that's in your book, chapter six, calcium homeostasis. So let's just go through it. So we have our controlled condition, which is our blood calcium levels. Some stress or stimulus is disrupting homeostasis by decreasing your blood calcium level. That means you're becoming hypocalcemic. So when your calcium levels start to drop, the parathyroid gland cells produce and release parathyroid hormone. There's a little gene that's turned on on the inside of the cell because of low calcium levels. The low calcium level triggers on the inside of the cell for a signal molecule to be produced called cyclic AMP. So inside the parathyroid gland cell, at low calcium events, Cyclic AMP is going to be produced, which turns on the gene in the nucleus to produce parathyroid hormone. So now the cells are dumping parathyroid hormone out into the blood. So what does parathyroid hormone do? Well, it tries to increase your blood calcium levels. So how does it do that? It turns on the osteoclasts. Osteoclasts degrade the bony matrix, releases calcium in the blood, and your calcium levels start to come back to normal. <clears throat> now, the last thing you want to happen when you have low blood calcium levels is you don't want your, your kidneys to dump calcium out in urine. So, parathyroid hormone tells the kidneys to save calcium and puts it back into the blood basically reduces calcium loss in urine. The third thing that parathyroid hormone does is it also tells the kidney to produce the most active form of vitamin D, which is calcitriol. So the kidneys will produce calcitriol in the presence of parathyroid hormone. Calcitriol is the most active form of vitamin D and basically, it causes for a maximal absorption of calcium from the food you eat in your intestine. So as your food passes through your intestine, when calcitriol is present, your cells in your intestinal lining, which we learned on the first practical, is a non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium. Those non-ciliated simple columnar epithelial cells respond to calcitriol by absorbing a maximal amount of calcium from the food that is passing through the intestine. And so that helps increase your blood calcium levels. So the osteoclasts release calcium from the bony matrix, puts it in the blood. 
the kidneys reabsorb calcium, so we reduce the loss of calcium in urine. And the kidneys make calcitriol, which tells the absorptive cells in your intestinal lining, the columnar cells, to absorb a maximal amount of calcium from the foods we eat. And all of that increases your blood calcium levels back to normal. So when your blood calcium levels are back to normal, we then shut this loop off. It's a negative feedback loop. It turns on and off on its own. So when calcium is normal, the loop shuts off. When calcium is low, the loop turns on. All right, now the last thing that we have to talk about just briefly, you don't have to get into a whole lot of detail on this, uh, before we do the bones themselves, is how do we repair a fracture when we break a bone? And here, I just want you to know the steps involved um, in repairing a bone break. So obviously a bone break is called a fracture, so we call that a fracture repair. So here we break a bone, right? And when we break a bone, the first thing that happens is we start to bleed. Remember your bone is very vascular and we form a blood clot in there. So the very first phase, the reactive phase to the actual break is where we form what is called a fracture hematoma. The fracture hematoma is basically when we are gonna form this huge clot up in here from that little bit of bleeding. It's called a fracture hematoma. We then have our stem cells coming in here from our periosteum that start to produce cartilage, basically fibrocartilage. The fibrocartilage seals up everything where the fracture hematoma used to be, and it forms a callus. Since it's made of cartilage, specifically fibrocartilage, it's called fibrocartilaginous callus. So this is called the reparative phase. So we react first to the break, by forming the hematoma. We then have a reaction phase where we form the fibro fibrocartilaginous callus. And then this fibrocartilage has to be converted into bone. So during the repair phase, the fibrocartilaginous callus seals everything up. We then have to calcify this cartilage just like we do when we're making regular bone tissue. And then osteoblasts have to lay down new bone where the cartilage that we lay down first used to be. So that is forming what is called the bony callus. Then we have remodeling. Once we convert this fibrocartilaginous callus into the bony callus, notice the bony matrix is not smooth where it used to be before the break. We still have it kind of bubbled out everywhere. All of that gets remodeled. That is to say, it is rebuilt, broken down and rebuilt until it resembles the regular bone. Now that's just called the remodeling phase. And often a doctor, when they take an x-ray, they could see when you had a previous break. Because even though we remodel where we broke the bone to try and smooth it out, often you can still see a remnant of where that new bone was laid down. And that's why a doctor can see where it was broken. So we have these four basic phases uh, or, or what happens in four basic phases. We have only three categories of the phases. So the reactive phase, you form the fracture hematoma. The reparative phase, you're forming the calluses, a fibrocartilaginous callus, which is then converted to a bony callus. And then you just remodel the bone, make it look somewhat normal again. So that's how we repair a bone fracture. All right. All right, now, before we get into the bones of the appendicular skeleton, I think we're gonna take about a 10 minute break. So uh, let me stop sharing, share this again. All right, so in this PowerPoint, <clears throat> I included you know some tables, this all came from the book. The lecture book. But basically, the next two slides in this PowerPoint are definitions. What is a fissure? What is a foramen? A foramen is a hole. It's an opening where blood vessels and nerves or whatnot 
or ligaments pass through a bone. So there's clefts in bones or little slits in bones. There's holes in bones. There's little depressions in a bone called a fossa, right? There's little grooves in bones called a salsi or the sulcus in a bone. There is uh, an opening that's more like a tunnel or a tube, a passageway called a meatus. Now we won't see this until we do the skull, but <clears throat> basically just know the basic description of what these things are. We're gonna talk about condyles, large rounded elevations. Uh, what a facet is, is really gonna be covered, you know, when we get into the axial skeleton. I mentioned earlier we had on the humerus, and we're going to see it again on another bone, uh, something called the head of the bone. There's on the tip of a condyle, there's something called the epicondyle. Just like for the skin, we had epidermis was above the dermis. The epicondyle is above a condyle. We have a line, at least one of them, we're going to look at a lin the linea aspera on the femur. Um, the spinous process we're going to do in the axial skeleton on the vertebra. We have something called a trochanter, which is a very large projection. We're going to see really two of them. They're on the femur. The greater and lesser trochanter, I'm going to show you that. A tubercle, which is a smaller rounded uh, elevation on a bone. We're going to see those on the humerus. <clears throat> and then we're going to see something called a tuberosity. Um, there's a couple of those that we look at. And these are also long, rough projections off of a bone. It makes the bone look kind of bumpy, a bumpy surface. And so different bones will have these different types of markings on them. And all of these different types of markings are typically where either tendons attach where for muscles, um, where bones interact with other bones, things like that, all right? So we're not just learning the name of a bone, we're gonna learn what the parts or these projections off of bones are. And in particular, we're doing the appendicular, appendicular skeleton this week. The appendicular skeleton includes the bones of your arms and legs, but also what we call the pectoral girdle and then ultimately the pelvic girdle. So if you look at this picture that I have here, obviously you can see this, the rib cage, right? And the sternum. This is all going to be on the axial skeleton. But what we do see here, your upper arm bone, your brachial bone, this is the humerus. It makes contact with another bone, this one, that's kind of in the back from an anterior view. And if we look at the posterior view, you can see it. You know this bone as your shoulder blade. It's called the scapula. And then your collarbone is called the clavicle. So the clavicle and the scapula, along with the humerus, we form our shoulder joint. So the girdle up here is called the pectoral girdle. Helps form the attachment of our arms to the trunk of our body. All right. So what I want to do is go down through the bones briefly and teach you a little bit about them. All right. So let's start with the clavicle right here. Now notice this shows the bones articulated together. Obviously, the humerus is making contact with the, with the scapula. The clavicle is making contact with the scapula at this end and making contact with the sternum at this end. That's your collarbone or your clavicle, the bone in the front. So we're going to start with the clavicle. And there's basically a couple of, of ends here. We have a medial end. This is going to the midline of the body on this side. And this is a lateral end going over here to where your shoulder's at. So where the clavicle <clears throat> laterally makes contact with the scapula, it makes contact at the scapula at a projection we're gonna learn called the acromion. 
So the joint where the clavicle makes contact with the scapula is called the acromioclavicular joint. The name defines exactly what bones and where it's at. This little thing right here from the anterior view or this little projection over here comes off the spine of the scapula as we'll learn. This is called the acromion over here. So that acromion is where we form that acromioclavicular joint. At the, at the medial end, we form what's called the sternoclavicular joint. It's the joint between the clavicle and the sternum. And the reason why I'm showing you that is because we have to know which end is which on this clavicle. So notice what the clavicle looks like. It's kind of flattened out over here. You see how it's kind of flat? And then over here, it's kind of squared off a little bit. So this bulgy squared off area of the clavicle is what's called the sternal end or the sternal extremity because it's near the sternum. The area over here is kind of where the clavicle kind of flattens out is called the acromial end or the acromial extremity. So let me show you the clavicle disarticulated. So when we look at a bone that's not in the skeleton and attached to other bones, we say it's disarticulated. So ultimately you'll see a, a picture of a bone and you have to recognize this as the clavicle. So the clavicle has the two ends again. Notice this broad flattened out area. This is that acromial end again that kind of squared off bulgy area, that is the sternal end. So if we look at a clavicle and you're gonna be able to, you basically have to identify it as a clavicle and you have to know three things off the clavicle. The acromial, uh, the acromial end, that's kind of a flat end, the sternal end, which are called extremities, and then a little bulgy part of the bone itself this little knot that kind of comes off down here. This is called the conoid tubercle. A tubercle is a small rounded elevation on a bone. So you have to really know four things. What the bone is, recognize it, the shape as a clavicle. You have to know left and right on the clavicle. I'm gonna tell you how you know that in a second. You have to know the acromial extremity, the sternal extremity, and the conoid tubercle. That's what you have to know. That comes straight out of your engaged lab manual. Now, how, do, how would you know that this is a right clavicle relative to a left clavicle? And this is a right one, by the way. Well, I know this is a right clavicle because I know two pieces of information. I know what is medial relative to what is lateral. So you have to know the difference between the lateral end of a bone and the medial end of the bone. And you have to know what is, at least in this case, superior from inferior and other bones like in the arms and legs, we're gonna know anterior from posterior. But look at this clavicle right here. This is as if you're looking down on the top of the bone. This is a superior view. Now notice what it looks like. It has the acromial end over here, the sternal end over here, and then the clavicle kind of has this bend to it that goes forward. That little forward bend is always near the sternal end. And from the superior view, by the way, it looks kind of smooth. From the inferior view, if you're looking at it from the bottom, you'll see kind of an indentation. You'll see the conoid tubercle. It kind of looks rough. So you have to know that the acromial end is a lateral end. You have to know that the sternal end is the medial end. And in knowing that, 
this has to be a right clavicle because let's let's say we flip this bone over and put this acromial end on this side to say, okay, well, it might be a left clavicle. The reason why it wouldn't be a left clavicle is because the part that bulge, that's supposed to bulge forward towards the anterior of your body would now be facing towards your back. So this has to be a right clavicle because this is the lateral end, this is the medial end, and this bulge has to face anteriorly to the front of your body. So if you go to palpitate your clavicle, find your sternum, then you feel your collarbone, your clavicle. That little part of the bone that you're feeling, that rounded part, is this part right here, right? So we have to know this as a right clavicle, sternal end, a chromial end, and then if they have a little pointer on the little knot, that little rounded elevation that comes off, that's called the conoid tubercle. So let's look at this bone. This is a left clavicle, as opposed to the picture we just saw. This flat area is the acromial end. This is the sternal end, right? And so the bulgy part that faces forward is here. So this is going to be facing forward from the left side of your body, as opposed to this forward end. So this is on the, your right side, the right lateral side, and this goes forward. In the bone, the real bone picture, this is the left lateral side, and then the bone goes forward right here. So we have to know three basic things. You have to know the acromial and sternal end. You have to be able to identify that as a clavicle. And then you have to know this little knot. So down here on this bottom picture, the inferior view right here, this little knot towards the acromial end is called the conoid tubercle. You don't have to worry about all these other numbers on here. You have to know really four things, clavicle, acromial end, sternal end, and the conoid tubercle. That's what you have to know. Now let's look at the scapula. This is a right scapula. This is a posterior view of the scapula. So it's like you're looking at it by looking at somebody's back. So if somebody was standing in front of you, like you're standing in line, and you're looking at their back, this bone would be their right shoulder blade. So how do I know that? Well, to determine left and right on any bone, you really have to know two pieces of information. You always have to know what is posterior, and that's what we're looking at here, what is posterior from what is anterior, and you have to know lateral from medial. So you have to know anterior, posterior, and you have to know lateral and medial in order to determine left and right. So how do I know that this is posterior? Well, it's pretty easy on the scapula. This is one of the easier bones to determine right and left on, by the way. So I know this is the posterior part of the bone because of this ridge. This ridge right here is called the spine the spine of the scapula. So if you reach to your back and you feel your shoulder back there, you feel a bone, not the top, but on your back itself, below where the top of your shoulder's at. And that bone that you feel back there, you're touching this part right here. You're touching the spine. So I know this is the back of the bone. The other side is the front of the bone. Now, you might say, well, this could be the back of the bone and it could be on the left side of the body, right? Well, that's why you need to know lateral from medial. So the, this is the back, but this is lateral. So there's no way that this bone being the back can be on the left side of the body because this end over here would face towards the middle of your back. So we can't, that can't happen. So the end over here is lateral. I know that 
because this little area right here, which I'm going to show you another picture of in a minute, that area right there is actually an indented area, which if I turn the bone to face you to the front like this, we would see a lateral view of it. If we look down it this way, and this is what it would look like. This is what your scapula looks like if you're looking at somebody from their shoulder. If you're on the side of them and you look at their shoulder, if they're facing forward, you, the bone would look like this. So this rounded indented area here, and it's an indented area, is called the glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity is where your, the head of the humerus, your upper arm bone, would articulate in there to form your shoulder joint. So obviously your shoulder joint is on the scapula. The area where the shoulder joint is formed has to face to the outside of the body or more laterally. So the area where the glenoid cavity is, where this broad flat piece is called the acromion, and then another little piece up here that's more anterior is called the coracoid, the coracoid process right there. Now you can see it pretty good from here. Here's the coracoid process. So this is anterior over here. This is posterior over here. So how would I know? How do I know that? Because this is the spine. At the end of the spine is this broad flat piece called the acromion. On the anterior side of the bone, so if I was looking at the front of somebody, this is on the anterior side. It's called the coracoid process. So on the test, you're going to have to be able to identify this as a right scapula. You have to be able to identify the acromion, which is the extension off of the spine. You have to know the coracoid process, which is the part that's right in the front. You have to know the glenoid cavity, which also is called a fossa, by the way, the glenoid fossa right here where the head of the humerus articulates, you have to distinguish between the lateral border of the scapula right here and the medial border of the scapula, which is on this side. So that's why we also have to know lateral from medial. So this is toward, whoops, sorry. This is towards the medial part of your back and this is towards the lateral part of your body, the lateral border. The scapular notch is a little indentation right here. We have to know what that notch is called. So in between what's called the superior angle up here and the superior border, we have this little indentation. It's called the scapular notch. Obviously, we have to know the spine. It's one of the major identifying characters of the position of the bone. And then the superior border of the bone up here. So those are the things we have to know on the scapula. Now, again, why would this not be a left scapula? Well, because this is the back of the bone. So I know this is, I'm looking at the back, the posterior edge of the bone. And this side has to face laterally. So I can't slide this bone over to the left because then the glenoid cavity would be facing the middle part of the body. So let me show you a left one. Here's a left scapula. This is a posterior view of the scapula. Here's the spine of the scapula. So I know that's posterior. Here's the acromion, the flat extension off of the spine, right? So I know this is lateral because the acromion is on the lateral side of the bone. The glenoid fossa or cavity, which is this indented area here, is on the lateral side of the bone. <clears throat> so I also know then that this is the lateral border. That means this end has to be the medial border over here. And I know it's not in your book, but this is called the inferior angle down at the bottom. This is called the superior angle at the top. This little ledge right here is called the superior border, just that little line. And then where it indents right there is called this, this scapular notch. And then that part over there, which is anterior, is the coracoid. 
So that's the scapula. You have to know posterior from anterior. You have to know lateral from medial. So I'll show you this again. Why I can't slide this over to the right side of the body is that this is still the back. And if I slid it over to the right side of the body, your glenoid cavity and the chromium would be facing the middle of the back. And that can't happen. So this is left and this is right. So these have to face laterally to the outside of the body where your shoulder joint's gonna form. And this spine represent that we're looking at the back of the bone. So let me show it to you in an articulated state. This is the anterior view of the bone behind the rib cage back here. Notice it's all smooth and flat. We don't have a spine in there. The spine's on the back. The glenoid cavity's right there. The coracoid process is on the anterior side of the bone. So it's on the opposite side of the bone as the spine, the coracoid. If we look at the posterior view, which is very easy to identify because we have to know this spine. We have the superior angle, the superior border, the uh, uh, scapular notch. We have the acromion off the back side of the, the spine. You have the lateral border facing laterally towards your arm. You have the medial border, which faces the vertebral column. And I don't think they want you to know it, but that, the little point at the bottom, that's just called the inferior angle. All right, is everybody following me now? Oh. All right, so what's that? Sorry, I was coughing, yeah. Oh, gotcha. Very good. All right, so here's the anterior view of the left scapula. Again, you have to know the superior angle, the superior border right here. Now you can see that scapular notch a little better, right? And you can see the, the coracoid right here. The coracoid's on the anterior side of the bone. So how do I know this is anterior? Because there's no spine, right? So the coracoid's on the anterior. Back there on the back is the acromion right there. So this has to be the lateral border. It's so on the same side as the glenoid cavity or fossa, the coracoid and the acromion, all that's lateral. This is the medial border, faces the vertebral column. So if you're looking at the bone this way, it's like you're looking at the scapula as you're looking at the front of somebody. So this has to be their left bone. This is a lateral view of, of the bone right here, as we looked at before on the right one. This is anterior. How do I know this is anterior on this side of the bone? Well, because there's no spine. That's a spine back there. Off of the spine is the acromion. Where the shoulder joint is formed, that's called the glenoid cavity or fossa. That's the acro, uh, I'm sorry, the coracoid process right here. Here's it articulated. Here's the anterior view. This is a right bone. So this is a right scapula. This is a lateral border. This is the medial border. You see the clavicle up here, right there. It's articulating, the acromial end is articulating with the acromion. That's why that's called the acromioclavicular joint. And this is the coracoid process right here, right? Now on the back, obviously you see the spine again with the acromion back here, so forth and so on. Now what we want to do is get into the, our first long bone. Oh, really a second. The, the clavicle is somewhat of a long bone. The clavicle is more of a flat bone. But here's our upper arm bone, the, the humerus. There are several things we have to know on the humerus, on the humerus. So let's go and pull up this bone. So I need to know, well, let me show you this picture first, what's left and right. Now this is a right humerus. So you have to know anterior from posterior, and you have to know medial from lateral. Same thing. So I'm looking at an anterior view of the humerus right here. I know this is anterior because of several features. One, at the distal end, they have this little rounded elevation that we're going to identify called the capitulum. This little half circle right here called the trochlea. At the proximal end of the bone up here, there are these two rounded elevations, one here and one there. Those two rounded elevations are called tubercles. 
There's a greater one and a lesser one. I'm going to show you on the bone. So if you're looking at the bone and you can see the capitulum down here and the trochlea, notice on the back of the bone, you don't see that. You're looking at the anterior side of the bone. I then know medial from lateral because of two things. This larger rounded elevation on the side of the bone is called the medial epicondyle. So if you stretch your arm out and you touch your elbow from the inside part, that little bony balls that you feel is this bony projection right here, the medial epicondyle. So I know this is medial. It has medial in the name. So this whole side of this bone is medial. That's the medial epicondyle, but also the easiest way. Medial from lateral is the head. The head of the humerus, which is that little blue part in there, has to face into the shoulder joint. So the head has to face medially. Your shoulder joint can't be formed out here. So this is the medial side of the bone. This is the lateral side of the bone. And this is anterior. So the anterior side of the bone and the medial side of the bone is showing me that this is a right bone. So let's look at one disarticulated. This is a left bone. Now I know that this is the anterior side of the bone because I have the capitulum down here, which looks like a circle, a ball, and then the trochlea, which looks like a ball that's been cut in half right there. So I know this is identifiable on the anterior side of the bone, not the posterior side. I know that the head of the humerus has to face medially. So this has to form your shoulder joint with the scapula. So this is the medial side of the bone right here. This is the medial epicondyle. So this is a left bone. This goes into medially into the left scapula. This is the medial epicondyle. So this is what your left bone looks like relative to the right bone. The head of the humerus has to face medially going into the scapula from uh, lateral to medial. Same thing with the left bone, except it's on the opposite side of the body. So we have to know several things about this bone. I'm going to name them off. There may be more things identified on here than what you need to know, and I think there is, so I'm going to name these off. You have to be able to identify the head of the humerus, which is a the large rounded elevation at the proximal end of the bone. This is what forms your shoulder joint with the scapula. We have to know the anatomical neck of the bone. The anatomical neck is this dotted line right here. Basically it goes around where the head of the humerus attaches to the bone itself. So around this way, it's called the anatomical neck. We have to know the surgical neck. The surgical neck is just the area right here around the bone this way, which is in the metaphyseal region of the bone. This is the epiphysis up here. This is the metaphysis right here. And then the diaphysis is the shaft. So this is called the surgical neck. We have to know the tubercles. The tubercles are these. And you can see them from the anterior side of the bone. This, this rounded elevation that is a little bit higher up towards the head is called the greater tubercle. And this one, which is a little bit lower below the head. So you see the top of this one is here, but the top of this one is here. So the, the lower one is called the lesser tubercle. We have to know the intertubercular sulcus. So the sulcus is a groove that runs between these two tubercles. It's called the intertubercular sulcus. The word intertubercular means between tubercles, by the way. We have to know the deltoid tuberosity of the bone. So the deltoid tuberosity is this rough area of the bone right here. The deltoid tuberosity. See how it's kind of rough right there? That's called the deltoid tuberosity. 
You have to know the medial lepicondyle, which is this little bulgy part that sticks out. The bulgy part. That's on the medial end of the bone. You have to recognize the trochlea, which is this half ball right here. Looks like a ball that's been cut in half. That's called the trochlea. You have to know the capitulum, which is this more rounded projection at the bottom. I'm going to show you it articulated with the lower arm uh, antibrachial bones in a minute, but that's the capitulum. You have to know the coronoid fossa, which is on the anterior side of the bone. It's this little, I know they have two numbers here, but the coronoid fossa is just this little indentation right in the middle of those two numbers. Don't worry about these two numbers for now. Uh, on the practical, you have to know that just right there is called the coronoid fossa. The coronoid fossa is going to receive, that indentation will receive a bony projection from the ulna. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Then on the posterior side of the bone, you have to recognize a larger fossa, which number 15 is in. This big indentation right here receives another bony projection from the ulna, and that's called the alecranon fossa. So there's two fossas we have to know, an anterior fossa, which is an indentation here, that's called the coronoid fossa, and the indentation here called the alecranon fossa. So here are the bones articulated. So here's the humerus up here, here's the distal end of it. This is a right bone. The trochlea right here and the capitulum right there articulate with the two bones in your forearm or the antibrachial bones. The antibrachial bones, which there are two of them, lie either on the thumb side, so on the thumb side of your hand, that bone is called the radius on the thumb side. That's also the area where your radial artery is located that you'll learn later on. It's on the thumb side. On the pinky side of your hand, going up your arm is called the ulna. So look, what, look at the articulation here. The capitulum of the humerus articulates with the head of the radius, but the trochlea of the humerus articulates with what's called the trochlear notch. You can't see it yet on the ulna. So the trochlea articulates on the ulna, the capitulum articulates on the radius when you look at it in an articulated state. So let's look at the bone and name a couple of things that we have to identify. Um, let me follow the order of our book. We're gonna start with the radius. I'm gonna go back to the ulna in a second. So this is the radius. This is a left radius, and we need to know anterior from posterior. So this is an anterior view of the bone. So if you looked at your forearm with your palms facing up in a, a supine position, your bone would look like this. How do I know medial from lateral? Well, because of this little process on the end. This little process on the end is called the styloid process. And the styloid process is always on the lateral side of the bone. So if you were looking at your left forearm on your thumb side of the bone, this little projection would face to the outside of your arm, right? Now, there's only a couple of things that we really need to know on this bone. First, you have to be able to recognize this as a radius. So how do I know that? Well, the easiest way to identify this bone from the other ones is that the head up here the head of the radius is flat, right there. If we go back and look at this picture, look at the head of the radius in the picture, it's flat. It's articulating with this ball. So we have to recognize the head. We have to learn the radial tuberosity. The radial tuberosity is this rough area that we see here. And you have to know the styloid process. So identify the bone as a radius, learn the head of the radius, learn the radial tuberosity, which is that roughened area just below the head, 
and then the styloid process that comes off the end. Now on the ulna, which this is a left ulna, you're going to be able to recognize this as an ulna because of this large open area. This large open area is the only one we find. That's called a trochlear notch, by the way. This is where the trochlea from the humerus is articulating. So this area right here is spinning on, can uh, do a flexion and extension on the inside of that little mouth area, I always call it, right there. So on the ulna, you have to recognize this as an ulna. You're gonna be able to do that because of this large opening by the head or what's called the olecranon up here. You have to know the, what's called the radial notch. There's a little indentation right here. See how it kind of indents? That's called the radial notch because the head of the radius spins in that little notch, called the radial notch. You have to know the coronoid process. That little lip at the tip of the opening right here. See how we have this opening? At this end, this little tip, is called the coronoid process. The little tip of that, what I call the Pac-Man's mouth. Coronoid process. Then the, the large open area is called the notch, the trochlear notch. And you have to know the styloid process at the end of the bone, we have another little dip down there, just like on the radius. That's a styloid process. It also faces laterally. And up here at what you would call the head of the, of the ulna, and some books still use the head region, but we're going to identify this as, as what's called the olecranon process. So if you bend your arm and, and point with your elbow, the little pointy part of your elbow that sticks out when you flex your arm is this end of the ulna right here. All right, so we can look at it articulated. Here's the humerus. Here's the trochlea. The trochlea spins inside the notch. Here's the capitulum and articulates with the head of the radius. Here's the radial tuberosity just below the head. And then on the medial side of, I'm sorry, on the, the lateral side of the ulna is a little indentation just below the mouth that I'm calling the mouth. And that's where the head of the radius spins. It, it twists on its axis in that little cavity. So that would be called uh, the radial notch on the ulna. Now we have to learn the bones in the hand. The bones in the hand, we're only going to learn in an articulated state. So here are the bones in the hand down here, right? And there's eight little bones that form your wrist or the carpus. The bones in the palm of your hand, so these are called the carpal bones. The bones in the palm of your hand are called the metacarpals, and the bones in your fingers are called phalanges. So the metacarpals in your palm and the phalanges in your fingers are numbered. Your thumb side is one, two, three, four, five. So this would be the first metacarpal, second metacarpal, third, fourth, and fifth, so forth and so on. Now your thumb only has two phalangeal bones in it. And the phalangeal bones can also be called one, two, three, four, and five, but we also put in other names for them. We say proximal, middle, and distal. So look on the, on the fingers on, this, the, this is looking at the back of your hand over here, the posterior view. So we have a proximal phalange on our thumb and a distal phalange. But on the rest of your fingers, there's three little bones. We have a proximal phalangeal bone, a middle, and a distal for each one of your fingers. The part that is near the point of attachment at the joint between the phalange and the metacarpals, this forms the palm of your hand, these bones is called the base. So we have a base, we have a shaft, and we have a head. Now, I don't know if they're going to want you to learn that. I'm going to be kind of lenient with that, but I think you should know it. The base is always the proximal part of the bone. The head is always the distal part of the phalange. So we have 
proximal, 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 proximal phalangeal bones. Only on the thumb, you don't have a middle one. You only have a distal. But then you have middle, 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 and then the distal phalangeal bones. So that's the easy part of learning the hand. The other part, which is, I don't think is too terribly difficult, but some students have some trouble with it. We have to learn these eight little bones that are in our wrist. So I'm gonna go in order, starting at what is called the, the proximal row. There's two rows of bones, a row up here and a row down here. It gets a little confusing when we get over here to the lateral side or the medial side if we're in a prone position because there are two bones that kind of stack on top of one another right there. At the anterior view, we can see one of them better than the other one. And at the posterior view, we can see the other one better and not see the, the other one at all. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you which ones those are. So starting at the proximal row here at the top, we start with what's called the scaphoid. So you have the scaphoid right there. You have the middle one called the lunate. You then have the one that's below this ball that little piece right there, just on the edge, that you can see from the anterior view barely, but if we look at the back of the hand, that little bone right there at the top is the same as that little piece. That's called the triquetrum. So we go scaphoid, lunate, sort of on the bottom, the triquetrum, and then back to the top, the fourth one is the pisiform bone. So from the anterior side, you see the pisiform better than the triquetrum. From the posterior side, you go scaphoid, the top, the lunate in the middle, and then you see the triquetrum. But you can't see the pisiform from the top, from the anterior view. So this little ball that we see right here on your pinky side is called the pisiform. Then we start over on the second row on the lateral side. So the one that's by the base of your thumb, the base of the first metacarpal, that's called the trapezium. The next one over, that's on your index finger, the base of the second metacarpal, that little bone that's sandwiched in between there is called the trapezoid. Now I like remembering this one because I say, okay, this bone is trapped between these two. So it's trapped in the middle. So we have the trapezium, the trapezoid, and then you have the capitate. The capitate bone is one of the largest ones uh, that we see in the very middle on the uh, distal row of the carpus. And it's by your middle finger, the base of the third metacarpal is called the capitate. So you go trapezium, trapezoid, capitate. And then the last bone actually makes articulation with your ring finger and a little part of your pinky along with the uh, triquetrum, which we can't see too well from this side. That's called the hamate. Now, the hamate can be seen from both angles, from the anterior view and the posterior view. The triquetrum can be seen better from the posterior view than the anterior view because you only see that little piece of it. And the reason for that is this pisiform bone. The pisiform right here can only be seen from the anterior view. So they give you a mnemonic down here and you can learn it if you want. But I'm going to teach you one uh, that I got from Dr. Blaylock. I give him credit for it. I liked it, he used it. Um, it goes this way. And you always start from lateral to medial, start with the top row, then start over with the distal row and back over. So it's gonna be some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Pretty funny, huh? Yeah. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. So what are those words? Well, some is scaphoid. 
Lovers, L, is lunate. Tri would be triquetrum, but remember it's on the bottom of the Pisces form. Positions is posi, uh, Pisces form. Then we start back over here. They, uh, that, I'm sorry, is the tra trapezium. They is the trapezoid. Can't is capitate. Handle is hamate. So again, it goes, some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Those are the eight little bones of the carpus. So from the back of the bone, the one we can't see from the back very well, or see at all really, is the Pisces form. So you're not gonna be able to see all eight from the posterior view but you would have the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum. You would have the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. All of those, the only one you can't see from the posterior view is that little ball called the Pisces form. All right, so I need you guys to learn that. I need to start moving forward because we're gonna be running out of time. Um, let's get into the hip bone. The hip bone is called the oscoxic bone. The oscoxic bone is formed by three little bones. So this whole hip bone is called the oscoxic bone. We're gonna learn the sacrum later. We're not doing this one now. We're just doing what's in blue up here. So if I show you these bones disarticulated, we can determine right and left because we have to know lateral from medial and we have to know anterior from posterior. So if you're looking at somebody from the anterior view, you know this is the anterior part of the bone. You know this has to be the lateral part of the bone because of really a couple of things. One, this little cavity in here forms your, your hip joint. Your femur articulates in there. So this is lateral and this is medial. So this is a right hip bone. This obviously is a left hip bone. So if we look at it disarticulated, <clears throat> and I'm looking at the bone from this view, looking down the bone from the lateral view this way. This is what the bone looks like. This is a right oscoxic bone. I know it's a right bone because this is lateral. This is the, what's called the acetabulum. We have to identify that. And it has to face laterally. I know I'm looking at the posterior part of the bone because this large bone at the top is called the ilium and the posterior part of the ilium is all smooth in the picture and on a real bone. It's all smooth. Look at the back of the bone. I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, medial view of the bone, which goes more, this is more anterior. So th this is the anterior side of the bone over here. This is the posterior side of the bone. So look at this side over here, it looks rough. We're going to identify this as the iliac tuberosity in a minute. So how do I know this is a right bone? Well, I know I'm looking at this side back here is posterior. All of this faces the back. What's called the greater sciatic notch we have to identify is posterior. The anterior side of the bone has this anterior spine. It's called the anterior superior iliac spine. So I'm going to identify all the things that we have to know off of this bone. The oscoxic bone is made of three bones fused together. The big, broad, flat top part is called the ilium. The part that has this little rounded, uh, which is called the ischial tuberosity down here, that's called the ischium. That's the bone that you sit on, by the way, the bottom. And then the pubic bone, bone which faces the front. So we have the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis bone, pubic bone. So we have to identify a few things on this bone. One, you have to identify it as an oscoxic bone, and you have to know the ilium from the ischium from the pubic bone. Now, if you look at the ilium, on the anterior side, there are these two bumps. Those two bumps right there are called the iliac spine. Since they're on the anterior side, the word anterior is in their name. One, though, is higher or more superior than the other one. 
So the one that is more superior, that bump is just called the anterior superior iliac spine. The lower spine of the ilium on the anterior side is called the anterior inferior iliac spine. This indentation, which is formed by all three bones, is called the acetabulum. We have the pubis has this bone has a, a, a an extension at the bottom and an extension at the top. Those broad, flat extensions are called a ramus. So we have a superior ramus and an inferior ramus of a pubic bone. The ischium has what's called that flat part is called the ramus again. That's the ramus of the ischium. We have the ischial tuberosity, which is on the bottom down here. And then on the back of the bone, we have these spines. So on the ilium again, we have two bumps, one up there and one right here. Since it's on the posterior part of the bone, they have posterior in the name. This one is called the posterior superior il uh, iliac spine. And this bump is called the posterior inferior iliac spine. But we also have a little spine on the ischium. This little bump on the ischium is just called the ischial spine. Since we only have that one, we just call it the ischial spine. The last two things that you have to know are the indentations. The larger indentation that is higher up and formed mainly by the ilium is called the greater sciatic notch. The one below the ischial spine, that little indentation right there, is called the lesser sciatic notch because it's, it's smaller. Oh, and we ought to know this, this opening, by the way. This, an opening through a bone is called a foramen. And this opening is called the obturator foramen. The hole that you see right there is called the obturator foramen. So let's look at some of these things from a medial view. Like we're looking at the bone, this bone, looking at it down this way on this view. So now this is anterior. I know this is anterior because of my super, anterior superior iliac spine faces anterior and the pubic bone, bone faces anterior. I know this is the back of the bone because the ischial spine always faces the back along with the posterior superior and inferior iliac spines. So see these names define exactly where you are. You have the anterior spines and you have the posterior iliac spines. One is superior and one is inferior. So anterior superior iliac spine, posterior superior iliac spine, and then you have the inferior ones, same name. Now the rough part on the medial side of the ilium is called the iliac tuberosity. You still see that large indentation called the greater sciatic notch. You have the ischial spine off of the ischium, that little bump. Then you have the lesser sciatic notch. You have the ischium that is formed down here. This is the part of the bone that you sit on. So this is called the ischial tuberosity. We have the obturator foramen. And then you have your pubic bone. You the top part of the pubic bone is called the superior ramus up here, and then the inferior ramus down here, right? Now, the other thing I think that you're gonna have to know are these two things, and that's it. So I put this in here because you're gonna have to know what is called the pelvic brim. The pelvic brim is the top part of the inlet right here. So this is called the inlet, and the top part around the ring, that bone ring right there is called the brim. So that's the pelvic brim. The brim, the pelvic brim on a female is wider than on a male pelvis. The brim is smaller on the male. The other way you could tell a female pelvis from a male pelvis, predominantly the easiest way, is what's called a pubic arch. So these are the pubic bones at the top right here. They make an articulation together at this pad of cartilage called the pubic symphysis. So these are the pubic bones right there. 
These are the ischial bones, that's the ischium right here. And then the top part is the ilium. Now, the angle between the ischial bone, the pubic, I'm sorry, the pubic bones as it goes down towards the ischium, in a female, that angle is greater than 90 degrees. So this angle on a male pelvis is, has, a, has a tighter angle. It's less than 90 degrees, that arch. So that is called the pubic arch right there. Greater than 90 on a female, lesser than 90 on a male. Whoops, sorry. Let's see. Um, this just shows a, a, a oscoxic bone again. And you can see we're not doing the sacrum in the, in the coccyx bone here, but you can see the ilium at the top, the ischium, the round part, and the pubis, the acetabulum, the obturator for Raymond, the part in the back that's called the ischial spine, the greater sciatic notch and the lesser sciatic notch. Now, this notch on a female is broader than on a male. The angle is tighter, but that's not that important. The easiest way to tell male from female is this pubic arch and the width of the pubic brim. All right, let's talk about the lower leg bones because I'm really running out of time. I know your brains are tired um, and I have cl another class in 20 minutes. But nonetheless, we're going to talk about the femur, the upper leg bone in your thigh, the largest bone in the body, the two lower leg bones in your shin, and then the uh, bones of your foot. So let's look at the femur. This is the distal end of the femur. The distal end of the femur, bottom where it makes basically where your knee joint is formed. On the anterior surface of the bone, there's a smooth area right here. That's where your patella will ar articulate. That's where your knee kneecap moves up and down. That's called the patellar surface. Notice these bulgy areas off to the side. So the bulgy part at the very bottom, you can't see it too well from the anterior view. You can see it better from a posterior view. That's called the condyle. So we always have what's called a medial and a lateral condyle. <laughs> the bony projection above it are called the epicondyles. <clears throat> so the condyle is below it in this case because this is the distal end and the epicondyle is just above it. The, this is the medial side, this is the lateral side, although you can't tell from this picture, but you can from the whole bone. So how do I know medial from lateral? And how do I know left from right? Well, I got to know anterior from posterior and I have to know what is medial from lateral. So let me just go down what is medial from lateral. The head of the femur, which is big piece up here, this big ball, always faces medially. So this has to go into the acetabulum on the oscoxic bone. So that always has to face medially. So this is a right bone. So that the head of the humerus is gonna go medially this way. The left bone, the head of the humerus is gonna go medially from left to right. So this is the anterior side of the bone. How do I know that? The easiest way to tell is when you look at the back of the bone or posterior, you see these two large rounded elevations. Those are the condyles. So you see them a lot better on, on the posterior side than you do on the anterior side. The other reason is because of these elevations that we see here, that little bump and this little bump. Those are always posterior. So this is anterior and this is posterior. So this is a left bone, a left femur. You have to know these things. You have to know the head, the neck. You have to know, identify it as the femur. This technically would be the shaft of the diaphysis. You have to know the epicondyle, medial. This is the medial epicondyle because it's on the same side as the head of the femur. So that's medial lens. So that's the medial epicondyle, the patellar articular surface, and the lateral epicondyle. So let's look at the posterior part of the bone. You have to know the condyles. You have to know medial from lateral. Again, medial is on the same side of the head. The other one has to be lateral. This is the intercondylar fossa in, the, in between them. So this is the medial uh, condyle, the lateral condyle, the intercondylar fossa. 
You have to know the linea aspera, which is this line that you see right here. The linea aspera. That's on the back of the bone. You also have to know uh, the trochanters up here. The only bone that had the trochanters on them are, is the femur. You have a greater trochanter and a lesser trochanter right here. Then you have the neck of the femur and the head of the femur, right? Um, here we see, oh wait, let me see something else. Um, oh yeah, I forgot. You have to know, look at this line, the linea aspera. Then all of a sudden it tapers off and we get to this rough part. This is called the gluteal tuberosity, where this number 12 is at. So don't worry about all these numbers. Just go back and review the video and look at the names in your book. You have to know this rough area right here below the lesser trochanter. This is called the gluteal tuberosity. Now we have to do the lower leg bones. You have two bones in your lower leg, your shin bones, whatnot. Um, well, technically what you call your shin bone is a tibia. So your two lower leg bones is called the tibia and the fibula. All right. So let's look at the structures on these bones. So we have to know right and left on this tibia. This is a tibia. I know it's a tibia because the condyles at the top are kind of flat and not big, large rounded elevations. And then I have this little projection on the bottom down here. This projection on the bottom of this bone always faces medially. If you touch the inside of your ankle, you would be touching this bone. That's called the medial malleolus, right? So this is the medial side of the bone over here because that's the medial malleolus, which makes this the medial condyle. That makes this the lateral condyle. Now, this is the anterior side of the bone because I see this, this bump. If you feel just below your kneecap on your shin bone, there's a little ridge of bone tissue below your kneecap. You're touching this little round, this rough area right here. That's called the tibial tuberosity, this area at the proximal end. This is the proximal end of your bone where it forms your knee joint. This is the distal end of your bone where it forms your ankle joint, right? So you have to know it as a tibia. You have to know the condyles, medial and lateral, tibial tuberosity, and the medial malleolus, right? Um, I gotta show you the fibula articulated. I don't have one separate. So the fibula is the bone that's on the lateral side of your lower leg. You have to know basically three things. The head of the fibula up here. You have to name it as the fibula. And you have to know the lateral malleolus, which is on the opposite side of the medial malleolus, which is on the tibia. So those two lower extensions are called the malleolus. The medial one is on the tibia. The lateral one is on the fibula. And they encase some of the bones to help form your ankle joint. So we have to learn the bones of the foot. The foot's a little bit easier than the hand. So I'm just going to run down through them and then we'll be done. So the bones in the foot are called tarsal something, tarsal. The bones in your wrist are called the carpal something, right? We learned those names in, I don't know, the first chapter. So you have tarsal bones, forms your ankle. You have metatarsal bones, which forms the arch of your foot. And you have the phalangeal bones that form the bones of your toes. So let's start with the with the arch of your foot and the toes like we did for the hand. Your big toe only has two phalanges in it, just like your thumb. You have a proximal phalangeal bone and a distal phalangeal bone, right? So your great toe is called the, the hallux bone as well. It's called the great toe. So you have a proximal and distal. That's on your first uh, toe. Then we have the second, third, fourth, and fifth. They all have three bones. Even your little, your pinky toe has three bones in it. So you always have proximal, middle, and distal. So if they're pointing to this bone right here, 
That's your fourth proximal phalange. I know it's proximal because it's making a direct contact with the tars uh, metatarsal bones. Here's your metatarsals right here. It forms the arch of your foot. So this bone right here is your fourth proximal phalangeal bone, which is the same as this one. Or I could have said the one right here. This is your third middle phalangeal bone which is the same as that one right there, if you're, if you're following me. Now the metatarsals are just numbered one, two, three, four, five, along with, the, with your toes. You always start counting at the great toe. So the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsal. You still have a base, a shaft, and a head. The base is always the part that's closer to the ankle bones, the tarsal bones, I should say. And the head is always the one that makes an articulation with the phalangeal bone. Same thing we saw in the hand. So first, second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsal. Not too bad. But what about the tarsal bones? Well, that are helping form our ankle and our heel. Well, they have a mnemonic down here. I don't have a fancy one for this one like I did for the wrist, but these aren't that bad. Your heel bone is called the calcaneal bone, the calcaneus. So we're looking at the superior view. You're looking down the top of your foot. So that's the calcaneal bone, it's your heel bone. On top of that is what's called the talus bone. So this is what's gonna help articulate with the tibia and the fibula. The fibula is always articulates laterally, the tibia more medially. So that's called the talus bone. Then you get to the next big bone right here that the talus articulates with. That's called the narvicular bone. Then the largest bone going laterally is called the cuboid. So the four largest bones, calcaneus, talus, nervicular, and the cuboid. You then have three little bones called the cuneiforms. And they're just identified for the metatarsal that they articulate with. So you have the first, second, and third cuneiforms. They're also referred to as the medial, intermediate, and the lateral cuneiforms. So since I'm grading the test, I know all the names. So you can use medial, intermediate, and lateral, or just say first, second, and third cuneiform bones. So again, calcaneus, talus, narvicular, cuboid, first, second, third, going from medial to lateral. First, second, third cuneiform bones. All right.